our presentation today is dogs behaving badly. The reason badly is in quotations is because I really don't believe there's bad behavior. I think there's misunderstood animals. Um, and so I think once we understand them, we will find that suddenly, oh, they're just trying to meet a need. They're not actually being bad animals. And then hopefully I can give you some tips on how to help them. Um, these three are my dogs. I have five in total that live with me, all that have come to me because of behavior problems. Um, and so you guys will get to meet them today and see what I live with. A little bit about me. Um, I am Dr. Lori Rockwell. I hate talking about myself, so we'll just do this quickly. This is one of my other dogs. This is the one with separation anxiety. We were chatting before we went on camera. Um, I am a veterinarian. Uh, I have been a veterinarian since 2007. I am also a certified trainer through the Karen prior clicker training academy, which means I'm a positive reinforcement clicker trainer. I will have a master's in animal behavior and welfare as of August of this year, so I'm excited about that, just finishing my research. I am also certified in physical therapy, and I'm certified in fear-free and low-stress handling. So what does all of that mean? I really like behavior, and I like helping animals that are in pain to get better. So first question we always ask is, why do dogs behave badly? Again, I told you this already, my belief is they really don't. When dogs are exhibiting what I prefer to call undesirable behaviors, behaviors we as humans don't like, it's really because of one reason and one reason only. They have a need that is not being met for them. And so if one of their needs is not being met, they, need, they must find a way to meet that need. So we're gonna talk about those needs and we're gonna go through how we can meet them a little bit better. So, these are the needs according to one infographic. <laughs> so you can find different needs um, depending on which welfare research you need or you read. But according to the people at Pet Harmony, they have written a book called Canine Enrichment for the Real World, which is an excellent book. And these are the 15 things that they see as dog needs. We're not gonna go through them in depth, but we are gonna talk about which needs were not being met for the dogs that came to live with me, how I met them, and how that kind of changed their behavior. So we did say we're gonna talk about cases, so we're gonna go ahead and talk about some real dogs. And dog number one is Felix. So Felix is my goofy boy. Uh, when I met Felix, he was referred by a very well-known trainer in the Madison area. I don't use names because if they don't, they haven't given me permission, so I never give out people's names unless they told me they would. But extremely well-known trainer, been doing this for years. She referred him to me for suspected hyperactivity disorder. What is hyperactivity disorder? It's just like what it sounds like. It's very rare in dogs. A lot of us think dogs have hyperactivity disorder because they don't know how to relax but hyperactivity disorder is actually treated with um, amphetamines. <laughs> so it's actually incredibly rare that we see it. He was nine months old, neutered, um, and he was living with a family in the Rockford area. So this was the problem list that the family sent me. So he's hyperactive, he's destructive. Actually it was, he shreds everything, he chews everything. There's nothing safe in our house. I re reread his history last night steals things, so they had a two and a half year old toddler, so he's stealing her toys. Um, there's no way they can tire him out. We'll talk about how much activity he was getting. Um, he barks constantly at every noise he hears, and he absolutely hates crates. We have to push him into his crate and lock him in there to get him to sleep. So this was my little buddy when I met him. When I went through their history form, um, so when I take a behavior history, people send me about 20 pages of information. It's a very extensive process. And I go through that piece by piece. And these are the things that stuck out for me. So they were a busy family with a two and a half year old child. They lived in a home with a fenced yard, but it was in a busy, noisy neighborhood right outside of a city. It was during COVID, so we're all on lockdown. So we all remember how stressed we were <laughs> during that period of time. Um, he was only nine months old. This was the amount of activity he was getting every day. So he was going on two to three walks a day, sniff walks in the loud, busy neighborhood. They were playing ball with him for one to three hours a day. He was going to doggy daycare 40 hours a week. And then he was also in some classes that she was able to find. So dock diving, fly ball. So this dog was kind of an adrenaline junkie, right? All he was getting was activity. Um, he was destructive unless they had him occupied at all times. So what that meant is they were constantly shoving new things for him to engage with in front of his face. Um, he had persistent diarrhea and vomiting from the time he came home with them. 
and he was crated, which meant they dragged him to the crate and shoved him in both of them together, uh, 6 to 9 a.m. and noon to 4 p.m. every day. So there's some red flags that are showing up, maybe not for you, but that showed up. Oh, I'm sorry, that showed up for me. So when I look at that information, the next thing I do is I pull out my needs chart and I say, okay, what needs are not being met for this dog? And it's a bit subjective, but once you really have an understanding of the needs, you can kind of pick those things out. So medical care, he had ongoing diarrhea and vomiting, diet and nutrition, maybe he has a food allergy, a food sensitivity, something's going on. Security, he didn't have any place in the home where he felt safe. Instinct, they weren't really meeting his needs as a dog or his needs for the breed that he is. Um, he had no foraging activity whatsoever. He was unable to be by himself. His environment was pretty chaotic with a two and a half year old um, and he did not know how to relax. So we'll go through each of these a little bit and kind of explain you know, what we needed to do. So obviously medical care and diet nutrition go together. He also had a persistent ear infection that I identified when I was there. He was petrified at the vet. Um, they did not believe in using pre-visit pharmaceuticals. So they were just pinning him down and digging at him and you know, handling him. So he was pretty uncomfortable there. Um, and then he had the ongoing vomiting and diarrhea. Big thing um, to think about, if your dog is really, really destructive, nausea and gut pain tends to lead to chewing and destructive and excessive licking behaviors. So if you're seeing those things, that is a really good clue that your dog needs to have a workup looking at their GI tract. Security, he had no safe place that he was comfortable. Yes, they were putting him into the crate, but obviously he didn't feel safe there, right? If you have to drag a dog into a crate, they don't see that as a safe place. Instinct, so we're gonna talk a little bit about another book since we're just scratching the surface of things. Um, dogs have to do dog things. What are dog things? They're things most of us humans don't like very much. <laughs> so they're things like chewing, shredding, digging, barking, chasing, investigating, foraging, scavenging. You know, most of us look at that and go, I don't want an animal in my house that does those things. Well, if we don't provide an outlet for those things, they're going to do them. And so we better find an outlet. They also need to do breed specific things. And this is sort of a new hot button issue that we're getting into. The person who's brought it to light is Kim Brophy. Her book is Meet Your Dog. She goes through the different classes of dogs, the different types of dogs, and explains how their needs are different. And what I want you to look at, so Felix is a mix of two different breeds. We know that because we've had some DNA tests done. So he is a Labrador Retriever and a Hound mix. Um, those are the two dominant. So when we look at those genetic panels, we wanna look at what things are more than 30% of the dog's makeup. Now, some dogs, nothing is more than 30%, so then we just call them a natural dog or a mixed breed dog. <laughs> but with him, he's pretty much a lab hound. And so what I want you guys to look at, and this comes from Kim's book, let's look at what does a Labrador retriever that is classified as a gun dog actually do, right? Why do we like them? Well, they're really cooperative, they're really enthusiastic about everything, and they're extremely outgoing, usually very social. Felix was all of those things, right? The things we don't like, <laughs> they're extremely active, so it's very hard to tire them out. They are athletes. Um, think about what we bred them to do. We bred them to go out in the woods, go out in the water, and hunt for hours upon hours upon hours. You're not gonna tire these guys out with physical activity. They're usually immature for life. So my joke is I call Labradors Labradorks because they're kind of like that young, goofy doofus forever. Um, and they're very dependent on their person. So if you don't want a dog that wants to be on top of you all the time, you don't want a Labrador or a gun dog, right? Like if you have a child that's very needy and needs your attention a lot, having that dog there may become a bit of an issue. So when we talk about the ugly, these are the things that we often are ca called for so, or contacted about. So people will say, oh, my Labrador, he never pays attention to me, he's so impulsive. Or they get really excited when they meet people, so they're jumping up on everybody and they want to go and meet everybody. I was just talking to a lady yesterday and she's like, I'm a dog trainer and this Labrador is driving me crazy. I've always had herding dogs. He wants to drag me across the street to meet everyone. Yep, that's a Labrador, right? Um, they're very destructive. They like to chew, they like to shred. Um, they're very restless. They're very hyperactive because we can't meet that need for physical activity unless we're taking them out hunting or doing other things that 
really work their body, so we need to work their brain instead. Um, they tend to be sensitive to loud noises and storms, so some of them are not so thrilled about guns. A lot of those guys have to be trained to be comfortable around gunshots. And then they tend to be very orally fixated, so they always want something in their mouth. They always want to be retrieving something. So if you look at this, if Felix's family had seen this before they had adopted him, do you think he would have been the dog that they chose? Is there any way that I can make these two match? Can I change his genetics? Can I change who he is? Can I change their whole family and say, nope, you can't have your two and a half year old anymore? Right, so I think you can kind of see the writing on the wall for what happened with Felix, right? And then this is the hound dog. So to make it worse, he's a lab hound. <laughs> so the good with the hounds, they're very social. They are extremely emotional. Some people see that as good. Some people see that as bad. I call them the dogs that wear their heart on their sleeve. They will show you everything about them. Um, they're pretty funny. They're pretty goofy. Um, anybody who has a hound knows that. But again, impulsive. They're very scent driven. If their nose is on a scent, you're in trouble. You're not getting them back to you. Their recall will be horrible. And they can be quite dramatic and they like to bay. How many of you guys have heard a hound dog bark? Yeah, it's super loud. It's the big And if you don't like that noise, you're gonna hear that noise all the time, right? And so you better be prepared if they're coming home with you that that is what's coming into your house. So the things I get called for, excessive barking, predatory behavior, chasing the cat, chasing the squirrel, you can't stop it. Um, they won't come when they're called, usually because they're smelling something wonderful. Um, they don't behave very well on leash because they're used to being in front. So when you think about what a hound dog was meant to do, they are meant to go out in front of people and locate the prey and then bay or bark very loudly to alert the hunters as to where they are, right? And so then the hunter is supposed to come over. They're not meant to walk in a perfect heel next to you. Trying to teach them that is not going to be an easy thing to do. Um, they tend to act first and think later. This cracks me up because I can think about him doing that yesterday while I was on a Zoom meeting. Um, and they can be very difficult to teach them to be confined. Okay, again, does this sound familiar? Think back to that problem list I showed you. All of these things are very breed specific problems that they're having. Had they known what he was when he, before they brought him home, these issues wouldn't have been a problem, right? They would have said, okay, he's not the dog for us, right? So next category is foraging. So foraging is a normal dog behavior. When we talk about animals and we talk about welfare, we look at what do these animals do in the wild? So we actually look at wild street dogs we understand that the dogs living with us are not exactly the same, but the base behaviors that are innate in them are there. The ones we've artificially selected for, that's where the breed specifics come in. So foraging is something that they tend to do about 30% of their day in the wild. So what are the things wild dogs do? They rest and they forage. And people are always shocked when I tell them, uh, dogs need to rest between 10 to 12 hours a day and puppies need to rest 18 to 20 hours per day. And we'll talk about that when we get to calming. Environment, dogs need a routine that is pretty predictable. When you have a two and a half year old child in the house, is the routine predictable? When you're home for COVID-19 and your whole world just got dumped on its head and you've got two adults working out of the house trying to deal with a child and a dog, is that predictable? No, it's chaos right? Everybody's stressed. So it's no wonder they're having some issues. The other thing that we were seeing with him, so dogs need an environment that feels safe for them where they're not exposed to stressors constantly. What are stressors to a sensitive hound dog? Being yelled at by your owners and being physically dragged into your crate, right? And that was happening multiple times a day. And it is not that these are not wonderful people. They are some of the best people in the world, but they were frustrated living with this dog. Calming, so you know, Felix was unable to relax. Some dogs, we need to teach them how to relax, right? A high energy dog like this, as a puppy, the very first thing he learned when he came to live with me, and that is ultimately what happened with him, is he learned how to relax. Um, so again, dogs need to rest. Adults, 10 to 12 hours a day, some up to 16 as they get older. Puppies, 18 to 20. Think back to how much activity Felix had in his day. 40 hours a week of daycare, one to three hours of ball play, classes. 
So if we think about that, we can go, okay, we're creating an Olympic athlete that is an adrenaline junkie that does not know how to relax, and then we want him to just lay still and be quiet. It's never going to work. And then agency. This is one that a lot of people get confused about. So agency is being able to have some control over your world. So if we think about us as human beings, right? Once we become adults, we tend to move into our own place. We can choose when we go to the bathroom. We can choose what we eat for dinner. Maybe it's chocolate cake today and maybe it's a salad tomorrow. Um, we can choose what activities we engage in and we can choose when we engage in them. When we think about dogs, they actually have very little agency in a lot of the things with us. We choose when they go outside. We choose what they eat. We choose when they eat. And so if we can pick a few things that they can have some control over, for instance, sometimes I'll get two different toys out and I'll say, okay, do you wanna play with the flirt pool or do you wanna play ball right now? And he knows what the toys mean because we've played them enough and he will grab one or the other and I say, okay, that's what we'll do today, right? So that he is getting some choice. When we're doing training, he always has the option to opt out of training. So he always has another activity that he can go to that he enjoys. So he can choose to do training with me or he can go choose that and that's not a problem. Allowing them to have some choice really helps them to become more confident and more stable. So we're gonna talk about Felix's treatment plan. So this is when Felix still lived in his former home before they decided he was not the right dog for, for them. Um, so step one, he had to go to the vet. To go to the vet, we had to give him medications because he was so fearful at the vet that he could not handle that. So we gave him medication the night before in the morning of, and then he went in and he had his blood work and his stool sample and he had his ears checked and all of those things done and those things treated. Um, GI always takes a long time to treat. <laughs> so that was not fixed by the time he came to me. We also started medications. So, and I'll talk a little bit more about medications in the next slide, but um, we started two different medications and that was really because I could not move the two and a half year old out of the house. Uh, she had to stay there. And I could not say, okay, family, go back to work so this dog can actually rest during the day. That wasn't a possibility, right? And so we needed to start medications because I couldn't actually change some variables about his life. Um, and then he started daily foraging in the yard. So we just started with a small area, scattering some of his kibble. His owners were giving him food puzzle toys, so things like Kong wobblers, things like, um, I'll have to remember, buster cubes, things you can put kibble inside and the dog can roll around. He got too frustrated by those, so please don't anybody get angry with me, but hounds and Labradors are not always the most intelligent of beings and Felix was not very smart when he was young. So those things were too difficult. I have met dogs that licking a Kong is too difficult. They don't understand how to get their tongue inside the hole. And so you have to teach them how to use those toys. Otherwise, it's just another stressor. It's just another source of frustration. Um, and then we needed to give him a safe place where he was comfortable and we did determine that he liked the sunroom and he was allowed on the couch in the sunroom. Felix had a lot of rules in his house. Um, so we allowed him to start resting in that area. And then the big sticking point was they did not want to put a baby gate up in their daughter's room and he was stealing her stuffies. Well, I hate to tell people this, but dog toys look exactly like kids' stuffies. So if you don't prevent access, the dog really can't tell that that's his stuffy versus the kids. Yes, there are some dogs that understand that space is sacred and I'm not going to go in there, but most of them don't understand that. <laughs> and so the more, our, the more their toys look like the kids' toys, the more likely it is they're going to st steal the kids' toys. So that was one of our sticking points where they said, no, we won't put a baby gate up to our daughter's room because they wanted their daughter to be able to have access whenever she wanted. So why did I put him on medications? These are the reasons why. So young child means unpredictable environment, right? When the kid needs something, the dog's needs are gonna be pushed off to the side. That's just what's gonna happen. Um, that's normal, I'm not saying it shouldn't. The owners were very frustrated with Felix. Like I have five lines at the bottom of my um, questionnaire that said, um, if this behavior continues, I will keep my dog. If this behavior continues, I will give up my dog. If this behavior continues, I will euthanize my dog give up and euthanize my dog were checked in big, black, bold marks. They had been dealing with these problems. They got him when he was eight weeks. They had been working with trainers. He's now nine months. They are very frustrated, okay? So they need to see a change very quickly. 
the other thing that was going on here is it was very obvious to me that Felix was not enjoying his life. So he had welfare issues and the family had welfare issues, meaning nobody's having fun in this relationship. So they need to see a change happen really fast. And so that does influence me as far as medications. So when we talk about medications, um, these are kind of our categories and our options. So we have short acting medications and these are kind of the classes. There's also some supplements. Most of those work on the GABA system, which if you and I want to talk about in-depth neurotransmitters, we can. I'm not sure everybody wants to talk about that. And then we have our longer acting medications, which are things like Prozac or Clomacalm or Reconcile or Paroxetine. And so why do you choose which one? So short acting drugs are going to change the problem right now. Okay. So if this is an urgent matter and we need to see a change very, very quickly. We're going to go with these. The other time they're very useful is if a trigger is predictable. What's a trigger? It's the thing that sets the dog off, whatever that may be. Now, Felix didn't have one set trigger. He had about a hundred triggers. <laughs> and so we're not going to be able to predict it. But like, if you know, when I take my dog for a walk on a leash, it's going to bark and lunge at everybody. I take my dog for walks at this time so I can give this medication two hours beforehand, for instance, before we go for a walk. Okay, great. That might be perfectly reasonable for you. Um, Long-acting medications, they usually take somewhere between six and 12 weeks to actually reach a therapeutic level. And so it's going to take a while to see relief from those. But the nice thing is they're raising certain neurotransmitters in the brain to kind of just stabilize mood. And that's what we're looking for with some of these guys. And I promise I'll answer questions when we're all done today. So this is phase two of Felix's treatment. So change of environment. Felix came to stay with me. Um, because they had had it. The rescue did not want to take him back. Um, and so they were trying to figure out a solution. Again, it was during COVID. So we have to remember a lot of places didn't have any place for these dogs to go during that time. Their traditional shelters were shut down. So we had a lot of confounding issues. And so I being the crazy person that I am said, I'll take him for a few weeks just to give you a breather because some of these families really need respite. They just need a break from this animal to decide like, can I live with them or not? The outcome was after two weeks without Felix in their home, they said, we don't want him back. And I said, okay, he can stay. <laughs> because I was smitten and in love. Because if you've been around an emotional, lovely, wonderful dog like Felix, who does not show any aggression whatsoever, and you have four others that are kind of aggressive and not so snuggly, you kind of fall in love with this guy. <laughs> Um, so at my house, things change dramatically. So we have no children. Yes, we have other dogs, but we have an environment that we can manage very effectively um, between my husband and I. So we stopped his medications. He didn't need them anymore in our house. We focused 100% on relaxation training. So the only time Felix got treats or got um, really engaged with was when he relaxed. So he would lay down, you're such a good boy, and I would toss some of his kibble to him. Then he would lay down on his mat, I would toss more kibble to him, right? And so within three weeks, we went from this crazy wild dog who couldn't handle anything in life to the dog that just runs over to his mat and flops down on his side and then looks at you with his tail wagging like, oh, I love you. Um, other things that we did, we met his needs. So he foraged for all of his food every day, twice a day. We went for hikes in the woods. Um, every day. So the first nine months I had him, I hiked for an hour and a half in the woods every single day. I know most people can't do that. I'm lucky that I can. Um, and he was on a long line. I did not trust him off leash. Again, he is a hound. His recall is not spectacular. It probably never will be. So he was on a 40 foot line. Um, and then in the summer, we do have access to a lake. So he gets to do that normal dog retrieving thing of swimming and chasing a ball and, you know, being a happy boy. So Felix is now four. He is still not on meds. Uh, he still is very successfully with me. He can go with me to lots of events. He's not here today because I didn't think this was a good environment for the lab that would be knocking all the cameras over. But um, he's a really happy boy, so we love him. Anybody have questions about Felix? Or do you want to save him for the end? No? OK. All right, so now we're gonna talk about my love of my life dog. <laughs> she does have cancer right now, so if I get a little choked up, that's why, because we know other things are coming, but uh, I adore this dog. She is the first, I think the first behavior problem dog I ever took in, so she is 12 now. Um, 
Sophie is a pity mix. Um, we call them bully breed. We don't know exactly. Um, so we know there's some pit bull in there. There's some terrier in there. There's some bulldog in there, but we don't really know exactly which one is dominating her personality. Um, she was brought in to me when I was in general practice to be euthanized because she bit a child. Um, and not an uncommon thing with a dog that looks like Sophie, and we'll talk about why that is. She was nine months old at the time. So here were the problems with Sophie. So she was extremely fearful, one of the most fearful dogs I've ever seen. Um, she obviously was willing to use her teeth when she felt threatened, which is what we classify as aggression. So she was willing to put teeth on human skin. Um, and she did bite a child in the face, and I can explain that um, situation, what had happened. Um, so the lady who adopted her lived alone but was a grandmother, had eight grandchildren under the age of seven that came to her house every day, did not inform the rescue of that when she adopted the dog. The kids were left unattended alone with Sophie within the first week that she was there. So none of us really know what happened, but we know the outcome was a child was bitten. The child was not seriously injured. She didn't need stitches. She didn't need medical care. It wasn't anything that was severe, but scary enough to say, okay, we don't want her. When you have a bully breed, especially that has bitten somebody, the rescues usually will not take them back. Liability is too high. Um, and so they said, sorry, you have to have her euthanized. This woman was absolutely heartbroken. Um, and then the reason I have possible anxiety on here is because we don't really know. So the difference between fear and anxiety. Anxiety is I'm worried about what might happen. Fear is it's happening right now and I'm afraid. And so those are two different things and we treat them very differently. So here's the key points in the history I gathered while this woman is in my office to euthanize this kiddo. So she'd been in the home for less than a week. Um, she was originally found in a dumpster in Chicago, so she was tossed out. Um, she was spayed. She came into the rescue. She was spayed and then placed into this home with all of these children within just a few days. Um, so very little time for her to adjust and recover. And she was referred for euthanasia because she had bitten. What I saw in my exam room. Um, if I had a picture, I would share it with you, but literally I had a bench like this. She was underneath that bench all the way back in the corner, tail between her legs, making herself as small as possible and just trembling. So she was absolutely petrified. Could that just be the vet office? Absolutely. So it could be the smells of the vet office, but when I questioned her owner, she was doing these things at home as well. And so what we had was a dog that was extremely fearful. I sat on the floor for about 20 minutes um, and I was kind of tossing food towards her and just talking to mom. And within 20 minutes, she crawled out and plopped her butt in my lap. And I was like, okay, well, I'm done. Like, I'm not euthanizing this dog now. She's going home with me. Um, and so when my technician then made a noise and came in the room and startled her, she ran right back away. So there were a few things in there that were key points to me in that I could live with this animal safely. What were they? Okay, she's fearful, but she wants to retreat first. So when an animal experiences a stressor, they really have a few options. And the main ones we see are fight, flight, or freeze. The ones that we worry less about <laughs> are flight and freeze because they're not going straight to putting their teeth on things, right? When a dog is putting their teeth straight away on people, it's very unsafe. We also knew that she had bitten a child. Children have quite thin skin, but she did not break the skin. And so that to me said, okay, this dog does know how much pressure to use when she's biting, that she's not causing injury. And so to me, I said, okay, I can work with this. And I had never really intended to keep her, but we fell in love, she stayed. <laughs> so what things weren't being met for Sophie? Obviously she didn't feel safe. Instinctually, she wasn't being allowed to do things that were normal or natural for her breed. Her environment, her environment was pretty chaotic and she was just uncomfortable there. I think everything in the world was a stressor for her at that time. Um, and she really couldn't calm herself down. She didn't know how to make herself feel safe or how to get out of situations in a good way. So we're gonna again look at breed because I think it's really important. Um, so pit bull terriers fall into the category of bully dogs or bulldogs. Um, so the good with them, very snuggly, they're very cuddly. Yes, she cuddles with me constantly. 
They're very entertaining when it's just Sophie and I. She's a lovely, funny, hilarious dog. Bring somebody else in and she's still nervous. Um, they can be outgoing, but they can also be quite fearful depending on what they've experienced in life. Bad things, uh, they're very all or nothing. So they go from zero to 60. Like if there's a toy, it's like, okay, it's mine. And now it's shredded within like two seconds. You know, they're very powerful dogs. Um, and they really, again, like Labradors, have no idea about personal space. They want to be right on top of you, in your lap, licking your face. They're kind of all over you. So things that I get called for um, about bully breeds. So destructive behavior, especially when left alone. So Sophie has eaten more Dansko clogs and destroyed more cell phones than I care to admit because she likes to grab my things and take them to her bed. She's not destroying them on purpose, but they do get destroyed. Um, they can be very difficult on leash. Um, sometimes it's because they don't like the other dog. Sometimes it's because they like the other dog too much. Um, they can be quite over enthusiastic. So uh, a lot of pitties do this behavior. I call it snarking, um, but it's very scary to people that don't know them. Um, and everybody has their own word for it where they like to come up and kind of nip at your hand when you're moving a little bit to kind of get your attention. Um, and it can be quite intimidating for some people. Pitties can be very attached to a single family member and they will defend that family member. So um, fortunately for me, I'm the one she loves. Unfortunately for my husband, he's not. Uh, but fortunately for him, she runs to her crate when he comes in the room. <laughs> so that's still, that is still her, her goal. Um, they can inflict really serious injuries as can any animal with teeth. So let's be honest, right? If an animal has teeth and knows how to use them, they can inflict a serious injury. Um, and they do, they do get very aroused, especially in stimulating circumstances. So people coming in and out, dogs moving in and out, they can get kind of wild during play. I wish I had a video of her and Felix playing. They can be quite noisy during play, which can be intimidating for some people. So the most important thing was Sophie was to really understand this. And I know it's a fuzzy picture because I can't find a way to blow it up really well, but this is, um, the stress escalation ladder, it was created by Turd Rugas, who is a dog trainer. She has a whole book about it. These are the signals that dogs tend to give when they are experiencing something that is causing them to feel uneasy or to feel uncomfortable, right? If we can learn this and we can catch them before they're getting up into that yellow and orange area, we can bring them back down or we can help them get out of the situation. So I'm gonna show you two pictures of Sophie and hopefully it's really clear to you which one is the fearful dog and which one is the happy dog. And what I would challenge each of you to do is take pictures that you have of your dogs and look at them in different situations and see what you're seeing. Now we always have to think about context, right? Because if somebody saw this picture, right? This is the one where she's really afraid. How do I know that? Her ears are back, her eyes are big and round. I can see the whites of her eyes, her mouth is closed. You can just see that her face is really tight. There's a lot of tension in her face. Well, I can tell you she's at the vet clinic there, right? So she's nervous in that situation. Does that mean that my dog is fearful everywhere? No, I have to look at context. I have to look at what was going on when I took that picture, right? Was my husband standing over here shaking something or was it a certain environment that she was in that she's uncomfortable with? That tells me I need to work with her getting her more comfortable going to the vet or I need to give her medication before she goes to the vet, which she gets. This one is, you know, happy dog, squinty face, tongue hanging totally out of the mouth, um, and just feeling pretty relaxed after being in the park. Can everybody see the differences there? So again, take pictures of your own dogs. Look at pictures of dogs on the internet. The ones that will get you are the ones with the kids on the dog's back. You'll see that most of the dogs look like this. And then somebody will say the dog bit out of nowhere. It's really not true. The dog was trying to say, please help me for an extended period of time. Okay, so treatment plan with Sophie. <laughs> she did not get euthanized, she came home with me, so there was a change of environment. Again, we have no kids. At that time, we had two dogs um, that were pretty confident, comfortable dogs, and she loved them. She was very happy with them. Um, she did start medications. Why did she start medications? Because she was petrified of everything in the world. When Sophie first came to our house, uh, I pulled the car in the garage. She was in the back seat. I just opened the doors and I made a trail of cheese. When you make a treat trail, you wanna put the treats about two inches apart and that will help to move the animal to a new environment. 
We did a treat trail of cheese every two inches from the garage into the house. She came out, ate two pieces, and went under the car. And she stayed there for a good 10 hours. Did I feel horrible? I did feel horrible that she's sitting there, you know, under the car. But am I going to go pull her out? No, because that's the space she chose that she felt safe in. I left the door open, and overnight she came into the house. I did sleep on the couch right next to the garage. <laughs> um, and so over time, she just became more comfortable. But I did add medications, and I added the short-acting ones that are going to start working right now today. Um, for her, she started gabapentin and trazodone. And then I also added the long-acting ones to help her to get more serotonin in her brain. And so we put her on Reconcile. Um, other things for her, she always, always, always had access to a crate. So I had a crate in every room of the house so that she did not have to run very far or pass anything that was really scary for her. Um, she also had big piles of blankets on the sofa because what we learned very quickly was the sofa was her favorite place and if she could burrow under a blanket and just be left there, she was very happy and content with that. Um, Agency, we gave her choice with everything. So I gave her choice to come out and I always reinforced her back away from me so she could approach me and if she wanted attention I would give her a little bit of attention but then I would toss some treats away so that she also had the opportunity to move away. I knew I was in trouble when she absolutely stopped moving away. <laughs> if she was here today she'd be sitting on my foot or be under there. She's always kind of next to me. And now she has started nose work, which we can talk about, but nose work is a wonderful sport. It uses their natural ability to smell things and they don't need a lot of physical ability to do it. So now that she has cancer um, and doesn't do a great deal of ball play anymore, she does a lot of nose work and walking around the house and finding specific scents and she absolutely loves it, so. All right, the nightmare dog. Does it, isn't he cute? Don't you just want to snuggle him? Yeah, unfortunately, he'll bite you if you do. <laughs> so Chance. Uh, Chance has my heart for other reasons, but he is definitely still a challenge to this day. And this is one of the things, the reason I wanted to share Chance is I want people to understand that when you're working with these dogs, it's for the rest of their life. Yes, things improve, but I don't think problems ever totally go away. Just like with people, when you have a mental health issue, you always have a tendency towards certain things. Um, and those are things that you have to control for the rest of your life. Um, so Chance, <laughs> Chance was uh, in a rescue. I was on the board for the rescue. And so they said, oh, we just took in this dog. He's kind of a nightmare. He was found running in a park. He's just, you know, our groomer won't touch him. Um, can you go look at him? So I went to his foster home and he was this little, this little white knot of hair, really. Um, so like if you see the ASPCA where they pull out the dogs that are all white and matted and covered in fleas and yep, that was Chance. Um, and just snarling at me the whole time. Like I couldn't touch him. I could be maybe about 20 feet away from him. And foster mom was like, I'm really afraid of him. <laughs> and I was like, I understand that. <laughs> um, so he was somewhere between one and three years old. We did eventually through some of my vet connections find out more about Chance, which you'll see in this next slide. <laughs> So Chance had what I refer to as learned aggression. Chance had learned that by growling at people, it would keep them away, and he wanted everyone to stay away from him. He has no trust of people whatsoever. Um, so one of the things we learned is Chance had belonged to a family that had five young boys, and sometimes young boys and little dogs, sometimes there's some issues that happen there. So he may have been handled a little bit roughly, and that may have contributed. I don't know. I never met them. Um, he had lots of triggers, so let's see. Making direct eye contact with Chance is a trigger. Um, touching him is a trigger. Uh, grooming is a trigger. Handling him for vet care is a trigger. Noises are a trigger, and it could be uh, a latch opening. So like, if you have a little latch on a gate, that will send him into a fury. Uh, and Chance is a, I will bite first and ask questions later for sure. Uh, possible anxiety, again, we don't know for sure possible fear and the reason I say possible I'm assuming he's fearful but he wasn't showing those fearful body language signals anymore because he's learned to use aggression to manage them right he's learned that if I'm bigger and tougher and growl and snarl everybody leaves me alone and so I'm going okay are you actually afraid or you know are you just managing your environment the way that you want to um barks and lunges at everything and everyone uh, noise sensitivity we talked, out and, uh, talked about, and this is what I found out from one of my friends when they saw Chance. Oh, I know that dog. 
And I said, oh, really, you do? Oh, yeah, we kicked him out of our vet clinic. And we were the seventh vet clinic to kick him out. <laughs> and he had also been kicked out of multiple groomers. So nobody wanted to touch Mr. Chance. Nobody wanted to work with Mr. Chance. So what needs of chances are not being met? A lot, OK? Uh, chance is what's called a chondrodystrophic dog, meaning his wrists are turned out um, and his cartilage is a little bit funky, so he probably has pain and arthritis. He also has luxating patellas at both knees, meaning his kneecaps pop off from where they should be. Um, and then he's kind of a long back dog, which means he probably has some back pain as well. Uh, hygiene, nobody can groom this kid. He's so matted and covered in fleas. It's, it's pretty awful. Uh, diet, he was very itchy, so always scratching his face, always chewing his feet, probably has some allergies. Also, really has to strain to go to the bathroom, so either his back is hurting or his hips are hurting or his stools are too hard. Um, security, Chance never really felt secure or safe anywhere unless he was growling at you and you were moving away from him. Then he felt pretty good about it. Uh, instincts. I do believe Chance is a terrier, so I don't think he was being allowed to do a lot of his normal behaviors. Uh, independence. He struggles actually to be by himself. He wants somebody there with him, but he wants you at a distance from him. Uh, environment. I don't think he'd ever lived in an environment that was predictable and stress-free because everything is a stressor. And obviously he doesn't know how to relax. So let's go through Chancey. Oh, that did not go forward, did it? Oh yeah, it did, sorry. Um, so originally when I met Chance, I thought he was a Maltese because he's very Maltese-like, but behaviorally he's very terrier-like. And I do think there's probably some Westie in this guy because he's very gamey, meaning he wants to chase squirrels, he wants to chase rats, he wants to do scent work, he wants to forage. And I don't see many Maltese that want to do those things. I'm not saying that some of them may not be out there, it's just not been my experience. So when we think about terriers, good things, they're very dynamic, they're very independent, and they're always up to go on any adventure. Um, but they do have a very one-track mind, they're very prey-focused, um, and they can be quite hyperactive, and I would say yes, that's chance. Um, difficulty following directions, <laughs> difficulty on leash, excessive barking, mischief maker, shreds everything, yes, this is all chance. Predatory behavior, spinning, when he eats, he spins all the way down the hall. To where his food is and then when he comes back he spins all the way back because he's just very excited about those actions he does not do it all the time we can't interrupt it it's not an obsessive compulsive behavior but he definitely does this crazy spinning um, quite competitive they can be pretty bossy with other pets and all of this describes him to a t in fact when i read this book i just handed it to my husband and i said who's this and he goes oh that's chance i said yes it is so what did we do for Mr. Chance? We are still continuing to work with this guy. So we have had him for, I believe, five years. We have made some progress, but he's one of these dogs that is 10 steps forward, 11 steps back. Um, he did have a medical workup. Um, we did do x-rays of his wrists. We did x-ray his back. Um, we looked at his teeth. It took me a 40 pound dog, he weighs 10 pounds, it took me a 40 pound dog dose of anesthetic to get him to stop growling. So this is a dog that is really, you know, I was at 40 pounds, I said, okay, I'm not doing anymore, I'll muzzle him, you shave him, I'll hold him and make sure that he can't get you. <laughs> because I was concerned that we were getting, you know, way out of line with our drug dosages. Uh, changed his environment, so we moved him in with us. He always has access to a safe space that he views as a safe space. Uh, medication, he has been on every behavior med that exists. He has been on up to eight at one time. This is not the norm. So he is my dog that uh, started me down the Chinese medicine herbal path and food therapy path. And now that we are adding those things in conjunction with his regular meds, we're seeing more progress. Um, Relaxation exercises, cooperative care, which is essentially teaching him to cooperate with grooming. I can groom him at home now. He does not go to a groomer. It's too scary for him, but I can do all of his grooming at home now. It's taken us a while, but we got there. Um, he forages every day, and then we did, we are, we did look at that, which is essentially a desensitization counter conditioning protocol where the dog looks at the thing that is a trigger when it's at a far, far distance away, and then 
you say yes, and then they look back at you and you give them a treat. And then eventually the goal is that they look at it and then they turn and look at you and they get reinforced for that. So he's much better outside. He's no more barking and lunging at cars, um, but he still has a lot of issues. So we are still working on flight training with him because he's the game interior. So he would rather fight <laughs> than run away. So we are still working on teaching him when you see a trigger, run away. Yeah, we'll, we'll see if we ever get there. But he has made progress. We do still love him. Uh, there are days, though. There are definitely days. So key points from today before I answer questions. Number one, before you get a dog, know the breed. If you have a dog, learn about your breed. Learn about what they do. Try to give them opportunities that are to do things similar to what they would be doing, if that makes sense, right? So if it's a hunting dog, give them some nose work. If it's a retriever, let them retrieve objects. If they get too excited with ball play, then hide the objects around the house and let them go get them and bring them to you. It doesn't have to be that high adrenaline running and chasing. Um, understand the needs of your dog and meet those needs, right? So if your dog is elderly and has arthritis and goes for a 15 minute walk and then they come home and they're limping, find something else to do with them, right? Um, do nose work. You'll see me going back over and over to nose work because it's really, really helpful. Um, understand body language. If you don't know body language, Fear Free Happy Homes is a great website. They have tons of information on body language. They have tons of videos on those things. I can come back and talk about those things. And then get help from experienced professionals. Don't go on Facebook, don't Google, don't ask your neighbor, how do I deal with this? Find the professionals who know how to work with these problems. Ask them what their knowledge is. Ask them what their experience is. Ask them if they've seen a dog like yours. You're gonna need a good vet that understands behavior meds. And I hate to tell you this, a lot of vets in this area are still uncomfortable with behavior meds. So if yours says, no, I won't prescribe it, find someone else. Um, or have your vet call somebody like me or a board certified behaviorist, somebody that can recommend things that are gonna help. Because otherwise what happens is you're just kind of playing what I call Russian roulette behavior meds, spin the wheel and let's just grab one and try it. And when it doesn't work, let's grab another and try it and let's put them on the max dose. And when we use those really high doses, we actually see some behaviors get worse. And so we don't wanna do that. Um, we wanna pick and choose based on what neurotransmitters we think the animal needs more of. We need understanding of that. Find yourself a good trainer. And I would always say, find yourself a good positive reinforcement trainer. Somebody who's not gonna recommend shake hands and choke chains and these things, not because they can't ever work, but because they're going to cause stress for the animal. We don't need to add stress to their life if they're already struggling, right? We really need to try to avoid those types of things, especially as a first line defense. Find yourself a good groomer, preferably someone who's fear free, who's gonna work with your dog and go slow and get them comfortable and take time so that they aren't afraid in those situations. And then fear free is, I don't know if everybody's familiar. Are you guys familiar with fear free? Yes, most people in this room are, maybe people out there aren't. Um, fear free is a certification that people can get that they have to learn body language, they have to take quizzes, they have to learn about behavior meds, they have to learn about gentle handling and conditioning and all those sorts of things. And so when they have that label, there's a better chance that they understand behavior and are gonna be able to work with you and to make everybody's life a little bit better. And they also now have for pet owners, the Fear Free Happy Home site on their website that's got tons of amazing information. So, um, so that is it for me. Anybody have questions for me? I know that was like a whirlwind of dog behavior, right? We just like scratched the surface, as I said. How can you train your dog to stay in your yard? The easiest, well, first of all, what kind of dog? Um, <laughs> So the biggest thing, you know, the biggest thing I'm always looking at is, you know, is it possible to put up a fence? If it's possible to put up a fence, just put up the fence. And I prefer a big physical fence to like a zap collar fence. And the reason is if you have a zap collar fence, you know, that shocks the dog when they go through, okay, well, what's the dog's incentive to come back home? Cause they're going to get shocked again when they come back home. And then how are you keeping everyone else in the neighborhood out? Right? And so I personally find that a fence is your best defense. But one of the first behaviors I teach all of my dogs is a recall. And it's a very, very solid recall. And how do I do that? 
Step one, they need to learn their name. So I say the dog's name, their ear twitches toward me, good dog, and I give them a high value treat. And when I say high value, I mean something that we eat, like lunch meat, cheese, something your dog will just start drooling when they smell, right? And every time, I, and then I go a little bit further away and I say their name, and then I start adding the come. So I'm a little bit further away, a little bit further away. But to just stay in the yard, I mean, really it's all based on what are the distractions. And with a Great Dane, they're a guardian breed. And so most of the time they will stick closer to home, but if they see something that they think is a potential threat, it is their job to defend it. It is their job to defend your home. And so the question then becomes, is this dog willing to use their teeth? Could this become an issue for me? And that's where I go, just put up the fence. It's a lot easier, you know, because if they see something they perceive as a threat, they're going to go out there to meet it, right? If they perceive something that they see as exciting, like a squirrel, they're going to run after it, right? And to stop that is going to be really difficult. And so I would say put up the fence or put a really long line and go out there with them. Because I don't know how big your yard is, right? Are we talking like 100 acres or are we talking like city lot, you know? Big city lot, big city lot. yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? I know that's probably not what you wanted to hear, but fences are easier. <laughs> yes? On that uh, lab hound mix, yeah. <clears throat> on your DNA, did it say which kind of hound it is? It, I think it was American Fox Hound, but I would have to go back and look. I just remember there was lab and there was hound, and I didn't look that deeply into it. I was just curious because I've run into a lot of the hound mixes, and then the people frequently find out what kind of hound it is. Yeah which makes a big difference too. It does, but most of them, if they're scent hounds, meaning they focus yeah. on smell, a lot of their behaviors are really similar. And so for me, I was like, okay, lab hound, I can deal with it. <laughs> Anybody else have questions? I, I have one. Yeah. Um, how did you get chance to take her first medication if you couldn't approach her or touch her? So I, I put it in um, pill pockets and I actually teach all of my dogs to take drugs hands off from me. I never put pills down any animal's throat. Um, I think that that is, from my perspective, being someone that specializes in welfare, I, I think it's really sometimes very aggressive. And so what I always do, and I do this with cats and dogs when they start, when they come to live with me, is I give them a piece of a pill pocket. I don't know if you guys know what pill pockets are, but they're these little sticky things that you can put treats in. I, I usually use the milk bone version because it's cheaper. Not that the pill pocket formulation isn't great, but it's pretty expensive. Um, pill pockets have a lot more flavors available than milk bone. Milk bones is bacon flavored. That's pretty much it. Um, so I give them a piece of that and they eat it and then I give them a high value treat and then I give them a piece of that and I put it on a very particular plate for that animal. So texture, color, whatever it is, it's specifically for that particular animal so that the other animals aren't trying to come and get it. And then once they're doing that, I'll take the pill pocket and I'll put a piece of kibble inside of it so they get used to something hard being inside of it. And again, same process. You eat that, I give you this. You eat that, I give you this, right? And then we put the pill in there. So it takes a little while, but honestly, most of them, it's one day and they're taking it. Cats are a little harder, but so far all my cats will take, will just eat their pills. So, so he just did it. I mean, it only, to be totally honest, it only took three weeks of like regular training sessions. So we did five repetitions every hour with me working with him with grooming for me to be able to groom him. So he did get better fairly quickly with some things, but he still has other things that he's not comfortable with. Are there pill pockets for cats? Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh. Yep. You can, use, you can use the dog ones. It's perfectly fine. It's not going to hurt them, but they do make pill pocket. That actual company makes them for cats as well. Yep. Thank you. Anybody else? You're all going to come talk to me as soon as the camera's off. <laughs> We all know that's going to happen, right? All right. Well, I'm glad you guys came out and spent your Saturday with me. If there's things you want to learn and you want more in depth than what I did today, just let me know. I'm happy to come back. Oh, yeah. One last thing. What's the funniest thing that ever happened to you when you had a dog? Funniest thing that ever happened to me with a dog? You probably remember. <laughs> i got to think. God, I've had so many dogs. Funny. 
I mean, Felix is probably my funniest dog that I've ever had. And he's knocked me down a few times, like in mud when we've been out hiking, because he thinks that's really funny. But I don't know that I thought it was so funny. Um, I think the most fun I've probably ever had with a dog was my Keese Hound. We used to go to Children's Hospital every week as therapy, and the kids would all get really excited because they thought she was a wolf because she had this big, huge coat, and they'd be like, oh, a wolf. And then they, she got to the point that any time somebody would say wolf, her tail would start wagging, really, you know. So that was pretty cute. Um, I don't know. I think I have more exciting things with other species, like the gecko that got stuck to the tape and I had to get him off. Like that was, you know, more interesting. So, yeah, thank you guys for coming.